It's wonderful today. Um, uh, we're going to still, uh, soon see uh, Christopher once again in, I think, two weeks. But um, today, uh, the spotlight is on Pablo, who has brought spotlight on himself through the DPDS spotlight. <laughs> so, um, uh, 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 Pablo is a well-known uh, character in the Link Open Data world already, uh, having done this uh, uh, thing serendipitously, uh, this thing, thing called the DPDS spotlight. And um, um, while uh, he's still thinking whether he should get his PhD or not, he has, he has um, uh, you know, gone out and got, gotten some decent experience. He worked with, um, um, uh, with, with uh, uh, Chris Bizzer, uh, who is known for Wikipedia related work. And uh, you can ask him, what is it to work with somebody like Chris Bizzer and, and, and hear that? Now, is it better or worse than working with Dr. Shea? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he, he's worked with Soren uh, R, 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 uh, and um, and uh, people you know like that. And um, and the other thing is, um, you should ask him, um, take him out for a dinner and ask him uh, uh, things like um, um, how, how the research environment in Europe uh, and the European research group compare with our research group, as an example, and see see what you know. Uh, what you learn from those kind of stuff and, and the out outcome and productivity and I think he's probably very proud of his productivity and rightfully so but you may want to kind of get a overall sense of it and uh, the world is global, your competition is global you might as well learn the pros and cons and what that is. Anyway, with, uh, without further ado then, here's Pablo. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back home <laughs> and uh, see so many familiar faces, and uh, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, this vision that um, we recently named as the Web of Linked Entities. And it's the same vision that, um, that's behind the workshop that's going to happen uh, Sunday, next Sunday at ISWC in Boston. So for those of you that go in there, if you want to attend and see some of the papers that were sent there, it was a very um, successful um, workshop submission and, and evaluation process. Uh, DK uh, was one of our, uh, helped us a lot there, one of our uh, members of RPC. And um, so we had about 27% uh, acceptance rate in our first uh, re review uh, of the papers and then we, we thought that was too competitive for a workshop. So we stretched it and we added other good papers that uh, also as uh, short presentations. And we brought the acceptance rate to 50% because we want people to submit next year again. They want them to be scared. And we, we managed to do so with keeping a good quality. So I think everybody that goes to the workshop is gonna enjoy that. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, DBP to Spotlight as one of uh, the tools that can be used in this process of creating such a, a web of linked entities. I'm going to try to show a little bit how the tool works, but I'm not going to go into uh, very technical details. Try not to um, not to bore you too much, but it's very exciting work. So if you want to uh, ask me about co how it compares to other tools that do the same thing or how does it work in the internals, I am, will be very happy to discuss that. As some of you know, I am very keen on programming and getting hands, my hands dirty, so I would love to talk about those things. And then I'm going to try to point into some directions where I think this kind of tool and, and vision where it can take us uh, on the web. So if we take a step back and we look at the web as, as it started in the 90s, um, and still largely today, what, what you're going to see is pages with mostly textual content. And these pages link to each other and they form sort of a, a network where it lets you to, to navigate between pages. So when you're looking for information, you're basically, as a human, sifting through these pages, reading it, trying to understand, and try to get an answer out of it. Uh, I think it's possible, probably better to change No, the, uh, then uh, we won't be able okay. to get this. Because I, I, I don't have the clicker, so uh, I have okay. to walk here. Um, so as humans, we have to try to get the answers out of these pages uh, manually. That also works. Thanks. 
Um, so, so there's this search and sift paradigm, right? So we arrive at the content by putting some keywords and have engines like Google who are very good at connecting those keywords to documents that, that talk about them, try to guess what you're doing and put you in front of documents. But you still have to then go through each one of possibly hundreds of documents and find the answers that you're looking for. So guys, um, uh, you should know about uh, your uh, lineage. Uh, so all those who are still uh, in the middle of their thing, uh, tell me who first used the word search and sift from our group. You get to do that. Okay? No solution. Okay. Yeah, so... Yeah, so there, there are some very interesting papers on the relationship web and, uh, and things. Uh, when Kartik was still here, uh, we were talking about uh, these things already. Um, and and the, the evolution that we're seeing on the web is that, so there's the creation of this web of linked data. So sort of parallel to what you have the web of documents, you have now a bunch of databases uh, exposed on the web via RDF, serialization formats, that can link to each other. And they can link each other not only pointing to there is a database in that website, but I can point to a specific record inside that database and say, this entity, Amit Chef, is a person, and he has, uh, he's in the database of professors in the Wright State University, but he also is in the ACM list of publications and Microsoft Search and so on. So you can point to specific things because you have web addresses, you have URIs to, refer, to refer to things. Um, so this provides uh, sort of this uh, explicit sharing of, of links of deeply interconnected databases. Thank you, Wilbur. Um, so the information seeking paradigm starts to, to shift towards direct querying. So now you don't need to go through 100 pages of, let's say, soccer players to find out how many of them played as goalkeeper in, in a place where it has a stadium with 4,000 seats, and then you can keep adding arbitrary constraints depending on what your information need, but you build this big query and then you ask to the web, right, if that's the vision, and you get an answer. So these are the four soccer players that are in this category. Um, so in, in, in the linked data, you can do this also by asking questions to uh, that, that get parts of the, the question, the answers from different databases. So perhaps the information that somebody's a soccer player is in Wikipedia, but the size of the cities, if they have about 10 million inhabitants, is coming from, uh, I don't know, the US census information. And Sparkle has already some support for doing this kind of query where you get answers from multiple, from multiple places. Um, and it's pointed out for those interested in some tutorial that we presented at www 2012 exactly about that, how do you do cross data set queries on the web. Um, and the view then finally of the web of linked entities is that we have now text and databases connected to each other, deeply linked, so that you can use information that comes from both the text and the databases to answer this big complex query that you have. Um, and ultimately, you ask a question to the web and then you get your answer. So this is the, the general idea and if you want something more concrete, that's deep interlinking because DBpedia was extracted from Wikipedia, right? So in Wikipedia you have uh, text and each page can cons be considered roughly uh, an entity, right? So you have for Barack Obama, you have a page for him and you have a lot of text about Barack Obama and you have other pages that talk about, let's say the United States, or the elections of 2012 that then link to the page of Barack Obama, right? So you have a lot of context in, in Wikipedia that are describing or talking about these entities. And what DBpedia does is that, how many of you know DBpedia? Can you raise your hand? So most people, everybody, okay? Yeah, so what DBpedia does is then put this information um, in structured form, right? So you would extract from uh, Wikipedia from uh, uh, mostly info boxes, these, fa these facts or statements that, uh, you know, Barack Obama is the president of the United States. And things of sorts. So you have this repository of knowledge about, you know, 
anything that people considered uh, notable, important things to put in this encyclopedia. And you have things from multiple domains and <coughs> hundreds of languages and, and so on. So you have this property of having text and structure interconnected deeply in, in Wikipedia DBpedia. So what DBpedia Spotlight is, is that a tool that will give an input of text, natural language text, find, recognize, and link terms or entities that appear in this text. So, um, and we can do this with all 3.8 million things in DBpedia of 306 different types, which is something different from most of the tools that are out there. So more concretely. So is there any, any uh, uh, quality process about having these 360 types? Um, the, the ontology is crowdsourced or community, community maintained uh, on a wiki. So any of you can go there and add a class and discuss, if, if you put something out online, you can, there's a discussion page, just like Wikipedia has done, we have a wiki for the ontology. So the quality process is community review. And uh, is that process uh, you would claim just like in Wikipedia content is community created, so you think that will cover a uh, vast amount of things in the world, or is there a, a tend to leave, limit to something very general purpose? Yeah, the, the focus of the Wikipedia is to stay generic, but as you know, the semantic web technology can extend and build your own sub-ontologies to plug in there. But our idea is to cover as much as possible in very simple terms, so it's very reusable for, for many applications. Um, so, so I said the WPS Spotlight recognizes and, and links uh, text to things in, wiki, in DBpedia. So here's an example. You have this paragraph that's talking about the Beatles. So Lennon and McCartney went to New York City to announce they were creating this company called Apple Corps. Um, and the WPS Spotlight would go through this text and then see that Lennon is actually a reference to John Lennon, that New York that you see there is not the state, it's actually the city, and, and then make these links to the identifiers of these entities and the knowledge base, which in our case is DBpedia. The challenge of, of DBpedia Spotlight in this context is uh, term ambiguity, because when you see Apple and you see Palm, um, and you, the terms are... Uh, well, the, sometimes they're spelled a little different, but, different, but for the computer, besides the spelling, uh, it's hard to tell them apart. For humans, we look at the context, and we can immediately figure out that some of them are talking about the fruit, some are talking about the hand, uh, palm my hand, or palm the company, or, or apple the, co uh, the company as well. And what the Peter, tries, the Peter Spotlight tries to do is exactly this job of tagging and, and resolving the ambiguity of terms that are identical with different meaning. Um, we organized this process in um, three or four stages. I'm not only going to discuss three today. Uh, and the first one is the recognition. So what you want to do is find in text what are all the names that appear, what things are uh, phrases that seem to be names of entities. And the simplest approach that we have is a dictionary base. So we go through DBpedia, we collect all names of things, build a, a prefix tree, and then we do substring matching text. I think many of you here are familiar with that because we, I think we implemented this algorithm maybe five times uh, while I was here in Oasis. Um, but after you implement it and you search through the string, what you get is, let's say for this paragraph, we get Lennon, McCartney, New York, and Apple Corps as our phrases that we're going to try to annotate. And our, and our next step is then to try to find out what is the meaning, what are the entities in the database that they refer to. Um, so the second stage is, given these names that I found, what are the possible interpretations? What are the possible meanings for, the, for these names? So I collected a few here. For example, for Lennon, uh, it could mean a city in Michigan. It could mean actually an album by a band. It, it can also clearly be John Lennon and many others. For McCartney, um, it could also be just a surname. Uh, New York clearly could be the state, the city, uh, and so on. So after we now collected the names 
found the possible interpretations, the next step is how do we pick one of these interpretations as being the correct one? And we call that disambiguation, right? So now we have to find a way to tell that that apple that I saw there is the company and not the fruit. And we do that based on the context uh, that is surrounding a word. So uh, basically on the text around it. So look at um, that paragraph that we've been playing with. What we can do is go over Wikipedia every time that we see Lenin and we collect that paragraph. And then we build uh, some statistics about everything, every word that has occurred with John Lennon, with the entity. And then we have now a model of what we think that Lenin means in, our, in Wikipedia, right, based on some kind of weighting between words and, and entities. And there are a few ways that we can do this. We experimented, for example, as modeling the, um, the entity by the page in Wikipedia of that entity. Also, in disambiguation pages, sometimes they have this one sentence that describes one thing in contrast to the others. Those are the definitions. And also paragraphs. So throughout Wikipedia, you link to, to other pages. And every link is actually a paragraph talking about that thing. Right? So this is a paragraph talking about Lenin because it has a link that goes to the page of John Lennon. So we go through the entire Wikipedia and we build this model. We also have other things that I didn't include in this presentation, but uh, if, uh, if we want to see later, I can bring afterwards uh, more details. So we also have other kinds of context. We can look at the graph and see the neighboring nodes in the graph. We have, um, uh, can use the link graph, we can use uh, Wikipedia properties. And so we tried quite a few different uh, approaches for this, uh, but I won't discuss all of that. Uh, instead, I will jump to a quick example. So this is how the tool looks like, the, uh, the user-facing side of the tool. And I pasted something about college football there. Um, talking about Louisiana State University playing some other team and what was the victory and so on. And then I started looking at the, the things that were found there and something popped up. So DDP didn't identify this as a university. So the Peter Spotlight said, this is the LSU Tigers, actually. The team that plays football, college football, from that university. And there is a semantic distinction there, right? The university is not playing the other university. The team from that university is playing. So I thought it was very neat that uh, the tool could do that. And the Borat got very happy. But um, uh, Simon got very sad because actually the tool was a bit greedy and looked at this number four and thought clearly we're talking about an album here called number four, especially because it's capitalized and everything. But it, they're actually just saying that um, the, the position in a ranking of this school is uh, number four. So sometimes there are errors like this that we have to deal with and we also have been playing with many strategies to recognize these uh, errors early on to, to kind of um, avoid trying to do work that we can't solve. Um, so what, another thing that you can't see in, in the user interface is you can get the ranking of the entities based on this context. So looking at this paragraph, our system thinks that the most probable entity is LSU Tigers, but the second most probable is Louisiana State University, the university itself. And there are so many others. So possible interpretations for that. And uh, I assume, I uh, don't remember now, but I think Tigers here is also a reference to uh, LSU. I don't remember Spotlight got this right. But uh, so these two entities, although they have different names, they're referring to the same entities, right? These two mentions are referring to the same entities. So, so then this is the Peter Spotlight uh, for nerds. It's uh, what we produce. So the, the demo that you're seeing is in this URL, so if you want to play with it. But we also have a REST API that you can plug on your system to, uh, to make calls and, uh, and use even parts of our process in, in your application. So um, the stage one that I was discussing, just finding, just recognizing the phrases, we call it spotting. So you can just call spot and get all the phrases and then apply your own algorithm of disambiguation and contrast with ours. Or you can have your own recognition things and then call it all, only our disambiguation and, uh, and then contrast who's doing better recognition and so on. Um, many people like this 
uh, API, the candidates, because you get all of the things that we found in a ranking and then you can potentially correct it with some kind of smart uh, technique based on the knowledge that you have. Did you have a question? Or? Um, all our source code is on GitHub and it's uh, licensed uh, Apache V2, which means that you can plug it to other software and this doesn't, it's a non-viral license, so you don't need to also open source your, your thing. So this is good for companies, and we've been actually talking to many companies that want to use and have been using this. Uh, so it has been uh, very um, enlightening for me to, to, to work with this license instead of GNU, which everybody's afraid of. So um, I talked about what it is, but perhaps we should go now into something more practical, right? So how can you then use this, uh, this tool to do something with it? Uh, and I think the easiest for everybody to see is in news annotation. So if you go to New York Times today, you already see that they mark some of their entities there. And uh, in, this, in this slide you can see it's something about the, uh, it's old, right, because now the election, election is done, but it's about the race for who's going to be the candidate of the Republicans. And there are some, some names here and some concepts. So Palestinian is annotated, Rick Perry is annotated, but not everything is annotated. And um, for the things that are annotated, if you click on it, you go to a topic page. And this topic page uh, has some information about what is the Palestinian Authority, some background here. There are some related topics, so Israel is there, Hamas is there. And then down here you have some other links to pages to other news that talk about the Palestinian Authority. So it's a way to interconnect their content, to keep you on their website for longer, to help you to understand the issues better, and so on. Um, and it's one step closer to that vision of the web of linked entities because they also have these unique identifiers for the topics and uh, interconnected to other topics and to other content that you can potentially pull to a database and ask questions about it, at least in, in some rudimentary level. So it's, uh, it's really one step closer. Um, I have also a discussion uh, of how why these things are annotated and others aren't. So for example, United States is here, but it's not annotated. Troops or uh, foreign, foreign policy and other things. But it's also something I didn't include in this presentation. Uh, but I'll be, I'll be glad to discuss uh, afterwards with you too, uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, just, just out of curiosity, anybody has any guesses? Why? Why do you see? Why is Mexico not annotated, the United States? Um, why nuclear weapons are not annotated? Any guesses? Maybe it's just uh, too much information. I mean, it's a very common. So, so two ideas. One is if you put too many things, it's hard to read, right? Too much information. The other is that some things are obvious, so they don't need to link to topics, right? Any other ideas? Only people. Yeah, I think it's people. only people. Maybe only people. That's not true because Palestine is also here. But that that refers to people, human yeah. beings, right? Like Palestinians. I see a yeah. group of people, only yeah. people and groups of people. Yeah. Perhaps Related it's not the, the case though, but uh, uh, it could be like types of entities. Types of entities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they you focus. Okay, only people, location, organizations. Pe many people do that. Um, so common terms, something like United States, is pretty known. So mm -hmm. but there is no gain. Right, no so game. maybe U.S. election related. Exactly, so also there is there's a topic behind this, right? So you only keep the things that are actually somehow connected to, to the election. Perhaps talking about the Israel-Palestinian issue is a, is a major decision if you're going to go with one candidate or another. These other guys are all related to U.S. politics, so it could be topical relevance. I'm guessing that you're creating some kind of central focus on the uh, article and then completing some distance. Uh, and showing something that is right, topic topically relevant to that. Yeah. So I mean, so these are issues that I'm discussing in my most recent research. Uh, I do have some slides about that. I didn't include in this present in this overview presentation, but if you want, I can pull them up afterwards and we can go into that. Um, but this is a very interesting topic for me. Just like why are people uh, doing what they're doing, and how do you, can you mimic this behavior for different applications, right? Then if you go to another news site, maybe maybe they're Features are different from these. So, um, okay. So 
then another use case is it's one of my favorites. It's a, uh, some work that we did here at Oasis that I think half of you knows, but worth mentioning because perhaps the other half doesn't. Uh, it's the paper that we got the Web Intelligence and we won the Triplification Challenge with is we said so suppose I have this it's a it's a brand tracking scenario so during that time the iPad was being released and we said now suppose that I am the product manager of iPad and I want to see how what people think about it so I want to go to Twitter and listen and see what are people talking about my competitors right? and I can do it now with Facebook Google Plus and all that if I could listen to those tweets and compute some, um, do some analytics with it, uh, how would I go about doing that? So we would have tweets coming in that say, you know, uh, my brother has a Surface and it's awesome, or this other S's uh, Infinity is better, and there are some opinions in there, and I know that some people are doing some quite nifty work with sentiment analysis here that can be used there. Um, but the problem being that you have too many of these, and how do you, you know, narrow down to pick only the ones that you care about, or how do you deal with that? So the first question that, that comes to mind is, if I'm going to focus on competitors, how do I determine the set of competitors that I have? Uh, and one way it could be you ask the product manager to list, I don't know, 100 products that they care about, then you get this set of strings, and then you start filtering based on the keywords. Well, there are other ways of doing that, and we said, well, maybe you we can experiment with something um, cooler here, we can look at actually annotations of these tweets, right? So for the first tweet there of this guy, some user, um, you have an ID, one, two, three, and uh, this tweet mentions those two entities that we can find, for example, with the VP Spotlight, and the second tweet mentions um, the transform infinity, and what can we do now with this information instead of just with keywords? And one thing that it's clear is that these entities belong to a knowledge base and therefore are interconnected with many other entities in a variety of ways. Can we use these interconnections um, to help with our task? And if you look closer, uh, these products actually belong to shared categories. So uh, they all have Wi-Fi, they all have touchscreen, and there are many other statements in this database that interconnect uh, these things. And so we thought, okay, let's model this, uh, the semantics of being a competitor but, uh, as uh, two products belonging to, the, to a shared set of categories. And what this allows us now is that instead of filtering by keywords, we can do some smarter filtering based on queries. So you can define something like a Sparkle query that says, select for me all the tweets that mention some product such that it belongs to a category that iPad also belongs to that category. And you can apply this to, to the tweets and express much more, much stricter, much richer constraints as compared to just keyword search. So this was uh, the idea that, that we worked with there. Uh, so you can clearly see the, uh, the benefits of using the, the knowledge base in helping this test. Uh, there are two things that I wanted to point out to. Um, the first is, um, when a new competitor appears in a, it comes up in the world, people create a Wikipedia entity for it, this entity appears in DBpedia and therefore is in our knowledge base. So uh, if I went with the initial idea of just having a set of keywords, what happens now, I have to have the product manager come to me and say, add this new keyword there, so that now it can also stream for that keyword. But here, since we're executing queries to the knowledge base, this entity appears in the knowledge base, we automatically know that it's a competitor because it, it's in the same Wi-Fi and touchscreen categories or, or something like that. So it allows for this smart filtering that automatically evolves. And the second and perhaps uh, coolest thing about it is that we found some things we didn't initially thought about. So it popped up in our query that iPhone is a competitor of iPad. And we didn't think about it because, of course, it's an Apple product. One is a phone, the other is a tablet. It's not really the same thing. But it actually, they compete for the same thing because I don't know how rich you guys are, but if I buy the iPhone, I run out of money to buy the iPad. So they're actually not selling their product, not because I don't like it, but because I can't buy it because I already spent on another product of theirs. So, so this kind of uh, knowledge base back to filtering it enables this kind of serendipity. You, you find things that you weren't expecting 
to find beforehand. Uh, so if you want more info on that product, the project, we have uh, everything else is uh, open source uh, online, and you can also talk to Pavan, which was uh, instrumental in making this happen. Uh, and uh, and you should talk to Pavan about it. But then. Uh, I wanted to conclude uh, this uh, overview part um, saying that this web of linked entities, although is a vision, is, it has been happening, right? It's not something that we are thinking that could happen in 10, 20 years ago. It's something that has been built and that many or probably all applications could benefit from this, uh, from this connection between structured and unstructured data. And for example, how these applications could benefit from this interconnection is that uh, you can build sort of a virtuous cycle where, so let's think about Wikipedia and DBpedia. We get information from the text in Wikipedia, and then we'll create a tool like DBpedia Spotlight, which can look into raw text and insert links into it. Now think about getting DBpedia Spotlight and applying it to Wikipedia again, and finding many of these places where Things are not annotated, but they should be annotated. So effectively, there's, I also have slides about that that I didn't include, that uh, our demo at WWW 2012 um, was about exactly this process. So we have a toolbar that Wikipedia editors can use. And as you open an article and you're looking at it, we can suggest you should tag this entity here because there's no link to this page. And once the editor goes there and inserts this link, saves the page, now this ends up in DBpedia as new information, and it becomes a new training example for the BPD Spotlight to learn from. So, so the editor is actually helping us to improve the training data that we used by using our tool. So it becomes this virtuous cycle where every time that you make a mistake, the editor says, nah, no, that's not it, that's the other thing. And then now you get this example for free back into your system so they can learn from it. So create this, uh, this nice idea, also inspired by Topher's paper on the um, virtuous, you call it the virtuous cycle or? No, it's uh, called a cycle of knowledge. Right? Cycle of knowledge. Um, so you should <laughs> talk to Topher if you if you like that idea too. Um, so that's it um, for now. I'm, I have uh, other things I could drill down into, so you can ask and we can uh, kind of have a conversation about these topics in, in more depth. Um, I wanted to leave two pointers. One is that the workshop that I mentioned beforehand, the workshop of uh, linked entities. Uh, and uh, the, this project is a project that's starting now at the uh, European Union that I'm working with. Um, it's about big data, and uh, we have both companies, like private sector and also uh, public sector uh, topics being discussed there in many different domains. Uh, and that's my contact information if you want to connect with me somehow. Um, so, do you have any questions? Is there a particular part of this that you would like me to drill down into? I'm going to how did you evaluate the previous part? Like, and when many you got the rankings, right? Like for the LSC example. Yeah. And then how did we evaluate it? In many ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pull up one of them for you. So this is one way that we evaluated it. First, we wanted to know if our spotting, the, the recognition part, is right. So we devised many different methods to do it, some that depend on the dictionary, some that don't, some that use probabilistic uh, lookups, some that use um, name data recognizers, uh, like in sequence labeling, so you know that uh, Shaojun Wang works with the CRFs, so something like that to, to segment your input. Um, we also mix that with the more linguistically uh, uh, influenced decisions. So we look at the parse tree. So what, what are the nouns and the noun phrases and adjectives and so on. And then we get the noun phrases and within those phrases we look at sub engrams of that. And then we combine that with name depth recognition and so on. And we try to see uh, in terms of precision and recall which of, the, of these would be better. And what we find out, we found out in uh, in summary is that um, all of these guys find many more terms, many more candidates of annotation than there actually are annotations in there. 
and one of the reasons is because sometimes there is ambiguity. So maybe Apple the fruit will not be annotated in New York Times, but Apple the company will. But if you use a dictionary-based method, you always are going to find that Apple is a potentially a, the name of an entity, right? And the same thing happens with, for example, um, the movie Up. It's something to say, you know, I went up that building. That's not the name of the movie there, but there's spelled similarly, right? There's a lowercase difference. Or what's up as the name of a song. So there are many reasons why uh, these methods find too many things. And then we devised uh, one way that we could actually narrow down the set of phrases that we find uh, without losing recall, too much recall. And uh, this is what this paper at uh, LREC 2012 was about. The other validation that we did was of the disambiguation, right? So now, if you actually, uh, if you look at the, uh, at, at the candidates and you try to always pick the correct interpretation for that, uh, we tried uh, some different methods and we added some baselines. So first thing we said, if our annotation set only contains unambiguous things, then we can just randomly pick and always get it right. So we put this random uh, baseline just to show that our problem is actually hard, ambiguous, right? And then we tried a few of these methods. Uh, so the default sense means we we'll just look at the most popular entity. So if you see Apple the fruit and Apple the company, but Apple the company is always annotated in our training set, there's a higher prior probability that that's going to be the one. So that's the default sense. And it does fairly well, but then we devised the a technique to use the words around with the prior um, to actually get better results. Uh, we also, sorry, we also ran that with, uh, the slides are not here, but we also ran that with only person, location, and organization. Uh, we also get something around 84% uh, uh, disambiguation. And then we also looked at the whole thing. So we went to, uh, to some uh, news annotations, and we tried to mimic exactly the kind of annotations that they had there. Meaning, if they spotted the guys that are related to politics, or the famous ones, or the people, but not anything else, can we actually get the same kind of uh, annotations there? And uh, we devised a, a score that we call confidence score that. Uh, and another score is the support um, that help us to, to say um, if the system found something and it thinks it could have been by chance or it was something that was definitely there or they think it's definitely there. And if we vary these, these scores, we compare it with uh, all these other systems like uh, OpenCalais, Samantha, Wiki Machine, and so on. And uh, basically what you see here is the precision by recall, but you can see that the behavior of our system changes as we tweak these parameters and allow us to get almost as high precision as Samantha and almost as good recall as Wiki Machine and also any other behavior in the middle. So um, so you can so these parameters will allow you at runtime to change how the system behaves. So if you are in an automated task and you need to the annotation to be definitely correct, but you don't mind losing some of the other ones, but the ones that it finds should be correct then you put it towards the precision, right? But if you want to find as many as possible, and then you're going to do another pass to perhaps try to fix it, you don't mind so much that there are some wrong ones because a human is going to validate, then you tweak it towards the recall. And so these are the kinds of experiments that we ran. There, I have other, many other results, but I won't go unless somebody else asks for them. Yes. The confidence scores mostly for your it's probably a letter ordering, right? You do not worry about the actual thing. So when you have ten items and you give out confidence scores for others, uh, when somebody is let's say using your service, right? So they give the confidence scores. So it's mostly relative ordering is what they need to get, right? So they do not the worry about how I compute the confidence score? Right, right. The numbers they do not worry about the number by itself. The, the like, number of ambiguous terms. The number, that, the confidence score number? It's between zero and one. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, so the support so, is not. The support is how many times we saw this thing annotated in Wikipedia. So it's kind of, it's the absolute count of 
that, that we used to compute the prior. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the confidence uses the information of how high is the overlap between the text of the input paragraph and the text that we collected for the entity. Uh, it looks at um, the distance between the first and the second candidate in the ranked list. So for LSU, uh, it's a tough disambiguation even for, for humans sometimes because if you bias the human, you say, is this the LSU university? Is that, they will say, yeah, that's the university. And then when you show them it's the team, they're like, oh yeah, yeah I changed mine, it's actually the team, right? Because they're so close to each other that it's easy to trick the system. So if that's the case, the system reduces the confidence a bit because they say, although we got a high contextual score, it, we got a high contextual score for more than one thing, so we're a bit iffy there. So that's the, the idea of the confidence score. More questions? Do you do the disambiguation by group or word by word? So you compare, is the disambiguation you choose for one word dependent on the disambiguation you're choosing for another word? Yeah, there are, yeah, there are basically uh, two ways to do this. Uh, one is called local, which is the word by word. The other is called collective. Uh, some, some are joint, like uh, optimization problems, so you have to find the uh, maximal clique, right? You have to find the thing that optimizes for all of them at the same time. And other, other, other approaches are also collective, but they don't require that. So for each one individual disambiguation, you kind of use the other mentions, and then you move to the next one, but it's not guaranteed to optimize, it's just using as hints. We've tried a few of those. Um, all the ones I showed there are local. Um, the global uh, optimization that we have is based on personalized page rank. Are you familiar with, with the idea? So for, for every node, we build a, a graph of the things around it, and then we walk that node for some time or until the difference in the change in the uh, transition probabilities is small enough. So basically, the things that are more closely related, and I have a slide for that, to, to each other will end up having higher scores uh, after the walk. So this is a practical example. So um, so we have Bulls, uh, Space Jam, and Jordan as the things you want to disambiguate. And uh, Bulls could be just a regular animal, it could be a team, and Michael Jordan could be a machine learning professor, it could be a basketball player. And when you build this graph, you find that some of these things are more interconnected than the others. So as you walk this graph and redistribute, redistribute the weights, you end up with Bulls, Michael Jordan, the athlete, and Space Jam as, as uh, being also Michael Jordan as the highest candidate. That's the very overview idea. Okay, so the very first example you showed about Beatles, I mean, that was... I thought they were using a joint uh, occurrence, right? Like that McCartney and Lennon and other things. No, so so I'm not, so that, well, I mean, that was just the example. Then we have many ways to solve that, right? So for, for every example that I showed, you could do it in any of these ways, right? But but for that example there, it has a an interesting effect because it will help you anyways to, so there, even when you're doing local, there is some collective, uh, flavor to it there because the words also appear around the graph, right? So as I'm going through the paragraphs and collecting th places where Lenin appeared, you're bound to get McCartney and Beatles and so on as words in there. So, so it, it, some of it kind of comes into the, the, the vector space model too, but it's not explicitly using the, the other mentions. And what I describe now is actually explicitly using that. Yes. Are there any other systems that are trying to solve the same problems? Or? Yes, many of them. Yeah. yeah so uh, I showed a few there. Uh, Semanta Wiki Machine and so on. There are they have web services. Um, this paper is from another. They don't have a system. They just have uh, described their system there, but they don't make it available for other people to use. So I can't actually run their system to compare with mine. All I can do is try to get the same data set they did and compare the numbers I get with the numbers they get. It's not my favorite way of doing things, but if that's all I can do. So yeah, there are, so they are in, uh, I think, the National Academy of Sciences in China. Uh, there is a system 
and the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, there's one in, uh, I think, Chicago, Illinois, or Urbana-Champaign, maybe. Uh, yeah, so many, many of them. If you want, I can I can share a list of the ones I know. Yeah. But uh, so the, how we compare with them is many, many, at least in their papers, uh, many of these systems they focus on solving the problem for one specific data set. So they they train their the, the way they approach the task based on, let's say, a news, uh, which is then very different from biomedical literature, which is then very different from tweets, and each one of these guys, perhaps just to make it uh, like more sane for them to publish a paper about it, they, they're focusing on very specific domains. And we are trying to actually keep the system as generic as possible so that during runtime, not training time, Runtime. We have a web service, and then you can tell me a few parameters and say, you know, uh, I want to get only people that are connected to the topic, uh, and that, uh, you know, any of the things that people came up with here, and the system tries to do that, right? Or you can go one step further and learn that for news articles, what you have to do is to always get the famous people that are connected to the topics for. Um, Biomedical literature, you have to find all of the entities that are of certain classes. For example, I only want genes and proteins. And so you could, and then at runtime, the user can tell me what you have is actually biomedical literature, so act like that. Okay? So we're trying to have a, a system that's as generic as possible that can adapt at runtime rather than having everybody having to download and train and add new things to it and things like that. You also helped us a little bit with, with our data on drug, on drug abuse. Do you have yeah. any slides, maybe? I was trying to find it earlier. I have one, I think. Just a, just a particular aspect of that data that I thought was interesting. Uh, So for those that don't know, uh, and if, now I'm nervous because I'm talking with people that actually know the project a lot better than I do, but uh, for th those of you that don't know the, pr the project, uh, they're doing some automated analysis of web forum posts and they're trying to find mentions of uh, medicine, like drugs, um, and of course they have a, a research interest in studying these things, but I'm not going to try to describe it, maybe they can afterwards, but from my standpoint, the task is to find mentions of these uh, pharmaceutical opioids and, and text. And the, what happens is there are many ways you can spell these things. So I'm not sure I can pronounce this. Bupren of Norfine uh, can be also spelled as bup or bup. Or, and then methadone can be meth and so on. And we have to find those entities. So we tried. They provided uh, they were very kind to provide some data for us to experiment with Spotlight. And I did a first run off the shelf. I just got Spotlight the way it was. And I ran their data set through the system. And I was like, mm, uh, unfortunately, I got only 64%. That's a lot lower than what we usually get. And so I went through the data and I said, let's find uh, what kinds of errors are happening here. And I found out that actually 34% of what we didn't find is because there was no connection between the name that we spotted, so like BOOP, B-U-P, and the drug buprenorphine. Um, only 1% was actually rank error. I chose the wrong interpretation for that entity. I uh, put the entity in second instead of in first or something like that. So then I went ahead and got some slang uh, lexicalizations uh, that uh, were, were also produced by them that was in their ontology. So name variation. And then immediately the system uh, jumped up to almost 95%. Uh, and when I when I present these slides, what I uh, what I usually I'm trying to say is that when building these systems, you have to look at in, at which stage of uh, of the system of the of the method the problem is. So sometimes people are focusing only on this integration, but actually producing name variations for these things or collecting them 
is a very important task. And this is an example where this ambiguation is not the toughest thing, at, at least for our approach, it was actually producing uh, the, the, the possible namings uh, for these entities. And then I went through the data again, and I tried to find out what are the kinds of errors that we still have, because there was still 5% that weren't found. And then I found that Loperamid was hard because it's confusable with 75 other things. And I'm like, what, what, what are 75 other things that could be lope? And, if, and it's actually Lopez, either with S or, or Z, which is a, a Hispanic last name. And uh, somehow, uh, you know, the, uh, the context of drugs kind of matched with the Hispanic last name of Lopez. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but um, but this is because I have some kind of fuzzy match between the names Lop and Lopez. Or maybe uh, people call it just because of Jennifer Lopez. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but, but in fact, um, this drug is much less popular in Wikipedia than some of these Lopez guys. So my prior might have been actually pushing too, too far. Well, Lopramar is uh, not a drug, right? I mean, not meant to be a drug. It, it is used in our case uh, as a way to ameliorate or reduce the side effect of uh, getting high with the opioids. Right. So, it is a drug. But like it is, a medicine. It is a medical drug, but not the uh, one that is used for like painkiller. So, much of what we are looking for is not, you know, mm -hmm. the one with uh, bad side effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, and also, meth has two different interpretations: uh, methadone and methamphetamine. Right. Uh, so we also mix a few of those. Uh, but I think that for for a, a domain like this, um, it should be possible to use some of the other things that we have, like the collective disambiguation and things that like use more of the knowledge base to actually fix these these mistakes. So I think we can actually stay in the '90s. Uh, the range of 90% or 95% uh, correctness uh, in this domain if we do a little bit more work in that direction. Did you build this um, slang lexicalization? And was it built manually or? I didn't build, I think it was entered by the experts in the ontology, is that correct? Or, yeah. So domain experts that know some of, the, some of these names, they add that this is a possible name for this entity in the knowledge base. Yeah, we tried to use Urban Dictionary, mm -hmm. but it didn't work because it was too broad to many ambiguous terms. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean, there's, there's even an interesting problem there, perhaps to try to go to Urban Dictionary and make it better, more like the humans would do it, perhaps. So it's an interesting, interesting topic, too. But I can see how it's hard. Yeah. Uh, regarding the DBBTA spotlight, so I have two questions like, do you maintain a big, huge index like uh, vectors for each word? And also, uh, considering the neighborhood, like you consider how how much length, like how many words for each entity to get the idea of the content? Um. So for the first question, uh, do I keep a huge index? Yes, we went through the entire Wikipedia, uh, collected for all terms how many times they occurred with each entity, and we have a couple ways that we store that. One is a Lucene index, which is used for information retrieval, right? So they have very compact ways to store and fast ways to retrieve. Uh, another way is we have a key value store, where the data is a bit more normalized. Um, and if we do a little bit of work with the um, power probability models and we remove some low counts, do some smoothing and so on, we can actually bring down the space so that we can actually load everything in memory. Um, and they have similar performances. Um, so we, we're now testing. So the database part is newer than the index, uh, than the Lucene one. So what you see online is the Lucene version. But we're trying to um, get the, the new the database one tested in, in production. Um, for the second question, um, we started experimenting with it and we didn't finish the experiments. We wanted to see how many words there are around, there are in the paragraph, 
and if the quality of annotation is directly correlated with the number of words, meaning there is a cutoff where it's just too little, too few words, I can't do anything with it, or there is a, a point where more than, let's say, 700 words, I usually can improve the performance a lot more, so I don't need to use all of them, I just pick the top 700 ones. I don't know if that's where you, what the question yeah, is. Yeah, right. So if you have more than many words, you just pick 700. Right, right. Yeah, so that's something we started looking at. What we do now is we get um, something like 200 words, so we get a paragraph, um, and we use that paragraph. So if it's the same entity appears in two different contexts, we can actually disaggregate them separately. And we have, we have a little coreference trick. So coreference resolution is a research task in itself. We don't do anything fancy with it. We just do the simple like uh, one entity per document assumption. So if we find many entities, then we try to reconciliate them for that document. Um, but uh, that is something that we always wanted to actually run and report in some paper. We, we haven't uh, finished the experiments yet. But we do see, yes, there are some examples with too few words that are too hard. And uh, as the documents grow, uh, it seems to get better, easier to disambiguate. But uh, I think that after a point, this is too large and it starts uh, getting co confusing for the algorithm. But that's, you know, that's not, scientifically speaking, that's gut instinct, like from what I see, like empirical observation. Okay, another thing, so the language model is actually on the Wikipedia text, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of Wikipedia, uh, why don't we go to like on like link open data sites, there are other data sets which are annotated and which are good quality data sets, like which are which can be medical domains from public so right. on built model on them that might include things like this. Right. So here. right. So if you apply to medical text and you train it on medical text, you're more likely to 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 get better. Um, we don't have many of these sources, though. I mean, you, you mentioned a good one. So PubMed has actually references to uh, Mesh and things like that. So it could use that. Um, but for new news text, there is there are some collections, but there isn't a whole lot. I think New York Times has one that's made, and uh, there are maybe a few others there. For tweets, there is now since maybe 2011, there is um, there's also a collection. So every time there's something like this pops up, we try to get it. Uh, and another interesting direction is how to do this with uh, web text, right? So can you go to the web and get some context? We, we also played with it, but we don't have results for it. So, Yahoo boss shut down. And then the schema.org annotations in the Right, right. Right. Related to that, I was wondering if you thought of making, taking your tool that you use for Wikipedia editors and putting it in, making a tool for web uh, content creators mm -hmm. because they want to use schema.org right. um, in order to improve their search engine rank. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you made this tool something they could say that they would do half the work for them, yeah. they might use it and then you'd have better annotated web text. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea. Uh, we have, uh, have uh, schema.org in our outputs, so we mapped the Wikipedia uh, classes to schema.org classes. So we already output that. So, but we, and another thing we did is we added to a uh, content management system. So if you're a blogger, there's actually a WordPress bug plugin that you can annotate your thing. Uh, but one thing that I didn't do that you're suggesting now would be good is to target directly the SEO guys and wrap something around my system that forget about the Wikipedia, forget about anything else, you give me your text and I give you schema.org stuff. Like clean it up to the point, it's so easy for them to use that they have no excuse, might be a good idea. And then we start generating more things on the web. All right, guys. Yeah, that was nice, very good.